Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone. Welcome to the course Development in Biology. Today's lecture is Regeneration. I am Dr. Priya Goyal, working as Assistant Professor in Department of Zoology, Dean Dayal Upathya College of University of Delhi. This is the syllabus of developmental biology that we are following. We are done with Unit 1, 2 and 3 and we have started with Unit 4 in which we are already done with metamorphosis and today we will take up the process of regeneration. In today's lecture, we will study what is regeneration, how the regenerative capacity varies across different species, types of regeneration, predominantly we will study stem cell mediated regeneration, epimorphosis, morpholexis, compensatory regeneration. We will take up the example of regeneration in Hydra, which happens by stem cell mediated regeneration, morpholexis, and epimorphosis. Then we will study limb generation in salamanders by epimorphosis and compensatory regeneration in the mammalian liver. Now, before we take up today's lecture, I hope you all are familiar with these terms. Differentiation. The process by which an unspecialized cell becomes specialized into one of many cell types that make up the body, especially during embryonic development. Then de-differentiation, which is the process by which a cell loses its differentiated character to produce back a progenitor cell that can further divide to produce more differentiated cell. Redifferentiation, which is the process during which Dedifferentiated cells lose their ability to divide and become specialized into new differentiated cell types. Transdifferentiation, which involves the change of one cell type into another. This might or not involve a mitotic division, or it may follow dedifferentiation of a cell to form other cell types. Stem cells are the cells that have the ability both to proliferate indefinitely and to produce one or more differentiated cell types. Tutipotent stem cells, which mean capable of all in Latin, have the potency to form all structures of an organism. For example, the earliest mammalian blastomeres, that is the eight cell stage blastomeres, that have the capacity to form all the cells of the embryo. Pluripotent stem cells, which in Latin mean capable of many things but not all, can give rise to different cell types that develop from the three germ layers, that is the mesoderm, endoderm and ectoderm, from which all the cells of the body arise. An example of pluripotent stem cells are the cells of the mammalian inner cell mass of the blastocyst, which are able to produce all the three germ layers and eventually all the organs of the embryonic body but not to the trophoblast. Then multipotent stem cells are the adult stem cells whose commitment is limited to a relatively small subset of all the possible cells of the body. And unipotent stem cells are the stem cells that can generate only one cell type such as the spermatogonia. So all these terms will be used in the lecture today in the subsequent slides. So what is regeneration? So students, if the tail of a house lizard is cut, it is able to regenerate itself from the remaining part of the tail you must have seen. In some cases, regeneration is so advanced that an entire multicellular body is reconstructed from a small fragment of tissue. Our human body spontaneously loses cells from the outer surface of skin, which is replaced with new cells. So all these replacements are actually possible by the process of regeneration. So what is regeneration? How do you define regeneration? Regeneration is defined as the post embryonic morphogenetic phenomena, which when temporarily stimulated brings about 
repair of the damaged cells or tissues or replacement or redevelopment of speared body parts or even the reconstruction of whole body from a small body fragment. Regeneration occurs by growth or remodeling of somatic. Regeneration was first of all reported in Hydra by Abraham Trembley in the year 1740. Now, regenerative capacity varies across species. As you can see in this illustration, among animals, there is a variable ability to regenerate. Regenerative capacity is very high among the protozoans sponges and sealant trees. In planarians, flatworms and hydra, small fragments of the body can give rise to a whole animal. Some annelids like earthworms are able to regenerate some fragments removed from the anterior and posterior parts of the body. Some mollusks can regenerate only the eyes and heads, while squids can also regenerate their arms. Some insects and other arthropods can regenerate only the lost appendages such as legs. Regeneration is faster in the young than in the adult. Now, echinoderms such as starfishes and brittle stars exhibit another phenomena of regeneration that is autotomy, in which they can regenerate arms and parts of the body once they are lost. Now among vertebrates in fishes, lamprey can regenerate its lost tail. Some can regenerate their fins also. Among amphibians, some salamanders, mules, and their larvae or the exolotl larva show a remarkable capacity for regeneration. They can regenerate limbs, tail, fins, lens, central nervous system, heart, and many other organs. Tail and limb regeneration is found in the uh, larval stages of toads and frogs also. The emperor newt can regenerate its dorsal crest, limbs, retina, lens, jaws and even tail. Among reptiles, lizards also exhibit autotomy. When threatened, lizards detach their tails near the base to confuse the predator and later regenerate the lost tail. This new tail differs from the old one in its shape, absence of vertebrae, and the kind of scales covering it. Regeneration in birds is confined only to parts of the beak, while the regenerative powers of mammals are much more restricted. The antlers of bear, uh, deer regrow each year. The mammalian liver can replace a part of it if it is removed by compensatory regeneration. Skin and skeletal tissues also exhibit a great power of regeneration. Fractured bones, as you all know, can mend by a regenerative process, but mammals cannot regenerate lost limbs. Although they have a limited capacity to replace some lost digits in early part of their lives. Now there are four major types of regeneration. Uh, first one being stem cell mediated regeneration, the second morpholexis, third epimorphosis and the fourth compensatory regeneration. In the first type of regeneration, that is the stem cell mediated regeneration, multipotent or the unipotent stem cells allow an organism to regrow the lost organs or tissues. This type of regeneration is seen during regrowth of hair shafts from follicular stem cells in the hair bulge and also in the continual replacement of blood cells from the hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow. The second type of regeneration is called morpholexis, which involves repatterning of existing tissues by the process of transdifferentiation and re-establishment of boundaries with little new growth or cell proliferation. Morpholexis is seen during regeneration in hydra. The third type of regeneration is called epimorphosis, during which adult structures de-differentiate to form a relatively undifferentiated mass of cells, which is known as blastema, which then redifferentiates to form the new structure. Epimorphosis requires active cell proliferation, and it happens during regeneration of a limb in an amphibian. The fourth type of 
regeneration is the compensatory regeneration. Here, the differentiated cells form similar cells. No de-differentiation or undifferentiated tissue forms. Compensatory regeneration is the mechanism seen in mammalian liver regeneration. Apart from these, when a different organ, both in structure and function, develops in place of the lost one, as seen in lower animals, the regeneration is said to be a heteromorphic one, and the condition is called heteromorphic. For example, the arthropod shrimp palinurus, if the eye is removed along with its optic ganglion, then instead of eye, an antenna-like organ is regenerated. If the development of an extra number of organs or parts of the body happens during regeneration, for example, the number of heads or tail limbs increases, then the regeneration is said to be supernumerary in nature. As seen in planaria and earthworm, a deep incision on the head can lead to development of additional new heads. There is another type of regeneration known as Wolfian regeneration in which regeneration of a part of an organ from a tissue other than its original embryonic tissue happens. This is a special kind of regeneration which is found in urotails and endurance and is named after its discoverer, Wolf, who discovered it in 1935. Wolfian regeneration is seen in the nude triturus. Here, if the lens of an eye is removed, the new lens is formed from uninjured iris. The original eye is, however, developed from epidermal ectoderm, but the regenerating lens is formed from iris, which is neuroectodermal in origin, thus showing Wolfian regeneration. So first we will begin the example of regeneration in Hydra, which shows stem cell mediated regeneration, morpholexis, as well as epimorphosis. Hydra is a freshwater nidarian about 0.5 cm long tubular body, which is radially symmetrical in nature. Hydra's body has an apical basal polarity. The head is present at the apical or oral end, which houses a conical hypostome region, which corresponds to its mouth, and it bears a ring of tentacles, which help in catching food just beneath it. It has a foot or basal disc at its proximal or the aboral end. And Hydra reproduces mostly by budding, that is an asexual form of reproduction. The buds form about two-thirds of the way down the animal's body. However, under adverse conditions such as crowding or cold temperatures, Hydra can reproduce sexually also. Hydra belong to the category of diploblastic animals in which there are two layers present, the ectodermal and the endodermal bioepithelium. As you can see in this diagram, the yellow is the endodermal myoepithelium and the gray is the ectodermal myoepithelium. Each of these is single cell thick and is separated by a thin extracellular matrix termed mesoglia. Here, mesoderm is absent, though you can see that the ectoderm houses on these cells the nematoblasts, the interstitial stem cells, the sensory neurons, the nematocysts and the epi, uh, endodermal epithelial cells contain the gland cells. The so stem cell mediated regeneration in Hydra occurs by virtue of three types of stem cells present in it. The first type of stem cells are the endodermal cells and second are the ectodermal cells. Both these are unipotent progenitor cells that divide continuously and thus they maintain these tissue layers by producing differentiated epithelial cells. The third type of stem cells are the interstitial stem cells, which lie within the ectodermal layer. Now, these interstitial stem cells are able to differentiate into nerve cells, endocytes, gland cells, and even gametes during sexual reproduction. Now, these interstitial stem cells proliferate in the central region of the body and then migrate to and differentiate between, within the apical and basal ends of the These interstitial stem cells are actually paused in the G2 phase of the cell cycle. And when stimulated, they immediately respond to a need for cell replacement through rapid proliferation. 
So these three cell types, the ectodermal, endodermal, and the interstitial stem cells are all that are needed to form a hydra. Even if a hydra is separated and re-aggregated all from all its cells, a new hydra can reform if all these three cells are allowed to remix. So hydra bears an extreme power of re-aggregation. And in addition to it, it bears extreme power of regeneration also, as was shown first of all by Tremblay in 1740. Tremblay shown that every portion of the hydra's body column along its apical vessel axis is potentially able to form both a head and a foot when hydra is cut into as many as 40 pieces. Tremblay is said to have remarked, that there are reborn as many complete animals similar to the first with respect to his experiment on hydra. In case of hydra, each cut piece, which should contain at least a few hundred epithelial cells, is able to regenerate and thus form a complete organism with a head at its original apical end and foot at its original basal end. Thus, hydra is able to exemplify morpholexis during its regeneration. When a hydra is cut into half, the half containing the head is able to regenerate a new basal disc and the half containing the basal disc is able to regenerate a new head and thus two new complete hydra are formed. Similarly, if a hydra is cut into several portions, the middle portions are able to regenerate both heads and basal discs at their appropriate ends. No cell division is required for this to happen and the result is a small hydra which then feeds and re to its original limb. Morpholexis in hydra involves WNT proteins. Here, remodeling or transformation of existing cells happens with no cellular proliferation. So, it is said to be morpholexis type of regeneration which helps in forming the head as well as basal end of the hydra's body. Hydra also shows epimorphosis during its regeneration. Various experiments have shown that when a hydra is cut at its midsection, the cells derived from the interstitial stem cells, that is the neurons, nematocytes, secretory cells and gametes, undergo apoptosis immediately below the cut site. But these dying interstitial cells produce a burst of WNT3 and this protein is able to activate beta catenin in the interstitial cells beneath them. This surge in beta catenin causes a wave of proliferation in the interstitial cells lying beneath the cut site which then undergo differentiation to regenerate the lost body, thus showing epimorphic regeneration, which is regeneration by cell de-differentiation. Now, what makes sure that the head forms only at the apical end and foot is formed only at the basal disc, though each part of Hydra's body has the potential to form the head and the foot? So, this assurance is coordinated by a series of morphogenic gradients present in the body of Hydra. A head activation gradient is present, which is highest at the hypostome or the head region is determined by the opposing gradient of two factors. The first factor being the head activator and the second factor is the head inhibitor. The second morphogenetic gradient is established by a foot activation gradient, which is highest at the basal disc and is determined by the foot activator. And evidence for such gradients in hydras was first obtained by grafting experiments, which began with Ethel Brown in 1900s early now, when a hypostome tissue from one hydra is transplanted into middle of another hydra, it forms a new apical basal axis, as you can see in the diagram A here, with the hypostome extending forward. When a basal disc is grafted to the middle of a host hydra, a new axis is formed with the opposite polarity, that is extending a basal disc forward. Now, when cells from both ends are transplanted, uh, simultaneously into the middle of a host. No new axis is formed or the new axis has got little polarity. 
So this concluded that a head activation gradient and a foot activation gradient exist in Hydra's body. The head activation gradient is highest at the hypostome or the head region of the Hydra's body and foot activation gradient is highest at the foot region or the basal disc. The head activation gradient is concentrated in the hypostome and decreases linearly towards the basal disc while the foot activation gradient decreases linearly toward the head region. So it was established that the hypostome in the head acts as organized in Hydra's body. Further experimental evidences by various researchers established that when transplanted, the hypostome can induce a host tissue to form a secondary body axis. The hypostome produces the head activation signal. The hypostome is the only self-differentiating region of the hydra, that is the property of an organizer itself. And the hypostome also produces a head inhibition signal that suppresses the formation of any new organizing centers or any other hypostome in the body of the hydra. So these evidences establish the fact that hypostome acts as an organizer in the hydra spot. Also, WNT3 acts as the inducer of this hypostome organizer region in the head. So WNT3 is the major head inducer act, which acts through the beta catenin pathway. WNT proteins are found abundantly in the apical end of the early bud, which defines the hypostome region as the bud elongates. Now, another set of experiments done by Brown and Board in 2002 established that hypostome acts as the organizer for the hydra. They uh, transplanted small pieces of head region into a host hydra whose cells were labeled with India ink or the colloidal carbon. And this established the formation of secondary axis in the host hydra. And they found that when hypostome was transplanted, it induced a new body axis in which most of the resulting head tissue was derived from the host tissue itself and not from the differentiation of donor tissue. Whereas when the subhypostomal uh, region tissues were grafted onto a host hydra, then the head and apical trunk of the new hydra were formed from the grafted donor tissue only, that is from the donor subhypostomal tissue and not from the host tissue. So this concluded that only the hypostomal region could alter the phase of the trunk cells and cause them to become head. That is only the hypostomal region acts as the organizer. And it was also uh, established that even a transient contact, which is not a permanent one, with the hypostomal region was sufficient to induce a new axis from the host hydra. And in that case, all the tissues of the new axis came from the host itself. So what restricts the formation of head at the apical end only, though every part of hydra body is capable of forming the head? So this is by virtue of another factor, which is the head inhibition factor produced in the hypostomal or the head region of the hydra, which again establishes a gradient being highest in the head region and decreasing as uh, it's, it goes lower toward the apical end. So in 1926, grafting experiments done by Rand showed that the normal regeneration of the hypostome is inhibited when an intact hypostome is grafted adjacent to the amputation site. So this finding suggested that one hypostome can inhibit the formation of another one. Thus, extra heads do not form in hydra. Secondly, if a graft of subhypostomal tissue is uh, placed in the same region of the host hydra, so subhypostomal tissue is the region just below the uh, hypostome which contains uh, some little uh, lesser concentration of head uh, activator and the head inhibition as compared to the head region. So when some tissue from this region was grafted onto the same region as done in the first experiment, no secondary axis was induced. Further, if subhypostomal tissue is grafted onto a decapitated host hydra, a secondary axis is formed. 
Now in B, it is shown that this tissue does not produce a head when implanted into the apical area of the intact host hydra. But if this subhypostomal tissue is implanted into uh, a region which is little away from the head, that is towards somewhat lower on the body of the hydra, then it is able to produce a bud or uh, we can say that the inhibitory effects of this factor falls off with its distance from the head. Thus, it was concluded that head formation in the upper two-third of the body is prevented by the specter head inhibitor, which is produced by the hypostome in the head region. Remember, the head activator is also produced in the head. So both the head activator and the head inhibitor are maximum in the head region and their gradients extend from the head down the body column. Now the head inhibition gradient falls off more rapidly than the head activator gradient. So the point where the head activator is uninhibited by the head inhibitor becomes the budding zone. So we see here that the inhibitor and activator gradients also inform the hydra which end is up and thus they specify positional values along the apical vessel axis. So when the head is removed, the head inhibitor no longer is made and this causes the head activator to induce a new head. The region with the most head activator concentration will form the head and once the head is made, it makes the head inhibitor and thus the equilibrium is restored. So now another question comes to our mind that what prevents cells in the lower one third of Hydra's body from becoming head region. So this is the third factor which comes into role here that is the food activator. Now head formation at the base is prevented by the production of this food activator. So ultimately from the head or the hypostomal region the head activator and head inhibitors are uh, making their gradient with the highest concentration at the head and going uh, as they go down the concentration of these two goes on decreasing and at the lowermost end the uh, concentration of foot activator is highest which goes on decreasing as it goes up. So we can see in a young adult hydra which is just formed or just regenerated the full body is covered by these gradients which one coming from the head and the other coming from the foot which uh, thereby block the bud formation in any other part of the body. As the hydra grows in length, the head and foot move apart which creates a region of tissue about two-third down the trunk where levels of both the inhibitors would be minimum and it is this region where a bud will be able to grow. So this is all about the phenomena of regeneration in Hydra. Next we will take up the limb generation in salamanders which occurs by the phenomena of epimorphosis. So the tailed amphibians, the salamanders and newts, they are able to regenerate any of the lost limb. As you can see in this diagram here, uh, the amputation shown on the left was made just below the elbow while the amputation showed on the right was done at the uh, above the elbow and it was cut through the humerus. Now in both these cases regeneration happens in a maximum span of 72 days and as you see that in both the cases only the lost parts of the limb are grown. That means that regeneration is occurring only in the distal region while it is not affecting anywhere in the part that was retained after the amputation. So when the adult salamander limb is amputated, the remaining limb cells are able to reconstruct a new limb, which is complete with all its differentiated cells arranged in a proper order. The limb regenerates the amputated part of the limb only in a distal direction from the point of amputation onwards. The lost limb can be regenerated multiple times. Rather, the salamanders are able to regenerate their eyes, heart, spinal cord, tail, brain, which they are able to regenerate throughout their lives. So here, regeneration of a structure such as this vertebrate adult 
limb which contains a variety of fully differentiated cell types happens in a highly organized arrangement as you can see now this raises a central question relating to the origin of these cells like whether these cells which are responsible for regeneration here were already present in the uh, limbs as some special reserve category that become active only after amputation or the differentiated cells which were already present in the limb they come into play as we shall see in the following slides that regeneration here occurs by virtue of the differentiated cells of the mature vertebrate limb which undergo de-differentiation then re-differentiation so as to form all the structures of the lost limb and hence the term epimorphosis is used for regrowing the lost limb in case of salamanders. Now the morphological changes during epimorphosis of limb are believed to be categorized into these four stages. The first one is the wound healing which happens immediately within 6 to 12 hours of the amputation or injury. Then comes de-differentiation which happens during the next four hours. Then formation of blastema which occurs till the eighth day of amputation which is followed by re-differentiation which is completed in 72 days of the amputation. So beginning with the first uh, stage that is the wound healing. What happens uh, after amputation of the limb? As the limb is cut, it causes some tissue damage which results in certain inflammatory reactions at the site of tissue damage. Further, the muscles contract, the blood vessels constrict and blood clot is formed so as to prevent any further loss of blood from the cut site. Now the epidermal cells of the skin immediately begin to multiply and they tend to spread all over the cut wound, which forms a sort of wound epidermis over the cut region. Later, this wound epidermis thickens to form epical ectodermal cap or AEC, which is a very important step during epimorphosis of lost limb. Now the phagocytic cells arrive at the injury site and the epical ectodermal cap gives the underlying tissues the signal to de-differentiate. As you can see in this diagram shown here, which is showing the anatomy of a, a limb blastema that will be formed uh, in the next slide we will study during the regeneration of the lost limb. So you see here that the longitudinal section of the regenerating mute limb following amputation, which is shown here with the dashed line and stained with hematoxylin neosine stain. And the lower diagram shows an artistic representation of the different cells and tissue components in the amputated limb. Here, whole of the green portion that is covering the tip of the uh, cut region that is being regenerated is shown as the apical epidermal cap here. So after wound healing, the next stage is that of de-differentiation. Now during de-differentiation, the extracellular matrix of the underlying tissues, underlying tissues means the tissues which lie just uh, under the cut site, they, it starts to get degraded by enzymes proteases. This releases the embedded cells of the specialized tissues of the limb like the muscle cells, bone cells, cartilage, fibroblast, neurons, connective tissue. That is all the cells of which the limb is made up of. Now these cells lose their differentiated characteristics. However, they do not fully de-differentiate. Rather, they uh, become restricted progenitor cells. Now cells from all these sources become histologically indistinguishable and now they are able to give rise to various cell types for example the muscle cell can give rise to a muscle cell or a cartilage or even nerve cell as has been demonstrated by certain experiments done and this de-differentiation step is genetically controlled evidence comes from the expression of mrf4 and mrf mrf5 uh, genes in the muscle cells which tend to get decreased while the expression of MSX1 genes which are associated with the proliferation of cells is seen to be increased. So here uh, virtually all the tissues which are lying under the wound epidermis, 
they undergo a dramatic process of de-differentiation. So we can say the previously well-structured limb region at the cut edge of the stump forms a proliferating mass of indistinguishable cells just beneath the apical epidermal cap, which will now undergo growth and differentiation to form the structures of the new limb that they are destined to regenerate. Now, once the cells de-differentiate, they form a blastema, which is a regeneration bud. Now, these de-differentiated cells, uh, they begin to collect under the epi epidermal cells or the epical epidermal cap or the AEC, where they form a regeneration bud, a blastema, which is considered to be a reminiscent of the embryonic limb bud. And this blastema further develops blood capillaries, it gets vascularized and innervated. Now this innervation of the regenerated tissue begins with the development of neurons in which both sensory and motor neurons have been shown to be developed. As you see uh, again in this diagram that uh, proximal to the cut plane lies the pre-existing differentiated tissues of the muscle which are shown purple here. The light blue color shows the skeleton. The nerves are shown in dark gray color here and the connective tissue is shown in white. Now once the wound is covered with the uh, wound epidermis which later forms the apical uh, epidermal cap, the cells from the distal tip of the existing tissues which are shown yellow here, they start undergoing de-differentiation. Now, these cells, after undergoing de-differentiation, they produce some specified lineage-restricted progenitors of each tissue type. All the cells that have been shown with different colors here are being de-differentiated. And these progenitor cells ultimately form a mass of proliferative cells directly beneath the epical epidermal cap or the AEC that is shown red in color. And this mass of cells is known as Blastema. Now, during the formation of blastema, the regenerated neurons start to secrete a new anterior gradient protein or the NAG, which is a nerve derived blastema mitogen that promotes blastema cell proliferation within five days of amputation. Now, the regenerated neurons begin to secrete a new anterior gradient protein, NAG, which is believed to be a nerve-derived blastema mitogen. It promotes the blastema cell proliferation within five days of amputation. Certain neurotrophic factors also begin to be secreted by the regenerating neurons, like the glial growth factor, GGF, the fibroblast growth factor, FGF2 and FGF10, along with transferrin. These neurotrophic factors are also able to produce blastema cell proliferation, that is, they also act as mitogens and they upregulate certain genes which are involved in regeneration. At the same time, the apical epidermal cap or the AEC secretes fibroblast growth factor 8, which stimulates the growth of blastema further. So we see that both regenerated neurons or the nerves or the innervation of blastema as well as AEC are essential for the growth of blastema. During morphological changes, the fourth stage is that of redifferentiation. During redifferentiation, the tissues that have already undergone dedifferentiation during the formation of blastema, they start undergoing redifferentiation. Now the blastema grows rapidly. First, it retains a conical shape and later it flattens at the dorsoventral end, which represents the carpus in case it is a hand uh, which is being regenerated or the tarsus if it is a foot that is being regenerated. Further, at the dorsoventral ends which are flattened, certain rudiments of the digit begin to appear. Further, they are separated by slight indentations at the edge of the plate and later elongate to form new digits. While the whole limb continues to grow until it attains the size of a normal limb. Eventually, the limb resumes a normal function and the function is of movement. All specialized structures of the new limb are generated. The new limb becomes indistinguishable from the other limb which was already present here. 
So ultimately, the regenerated limb is able to show a clear cut proximal distal anterior posterior as well as a dorsal ventral polarity. So this redifferentiation stage is again controlled by certain factors. Predominantly, nerve supply is required during redifferentiation also. Then the fibroblast growth factor is required along with retinoic acid. Retinoic acid is produced by the epidural epidermis. This retinoic acid forms a gradient at the proximal distal axis of the amputated limb and thus it helps in positional signaling of the limb that is being regenerated. This gradient activates the Hox genes which determine the limb pattern in the blastema. The next example that we are going to take up is that of compensatory regeneration mechanism that happens in the mammalian liver. So in the partial hepatectomy model, which was given by Higgins in 1931, specific lobes of the liver are carefully removed without causing any loss or damage to other lobes of the liver. Now the removed lobe cannot regenerate itself. However, the remaining lobes of the liver enlarge to compensate for the loss of the missing hepatic tissue. The amount of liver regenerated is equivalent to the amount of liver removed and the division of differentiated cells occurs to recover the structure and function of the parts of the liver that have been lost or the injured liver. Hence, this form of regeneration is known as compensatory regeneration. The liver regenerates by proliferation of tissues of the remaining lobes and not by the missing lobes going regenerating themselves. And here no blastema is formed. Now repopulation of the liver can be achieved via one of these mechanisms. There are three different approaches which are uh, believed to occur during regeneration of liver. The first of them being the self-replication of individual cell types. There are five types of liver cells majorly, which include the hepatocytes, the duct cells, the adipocytes, the endothelial cells of the blood vessels, and the macrophages, which are the buffer cells. Now, each cell undergoes division. And each of these five types of liver cells undergo division to proliferate and replace their own respective cell population. However, during these divisions, they do not undergo full de-differentiation. So this self-replication mechanism allows liver to synthesize the routine liver-specific enzymes involved in major metabolic reactions of the body while it is regenerating. That is, it is able to regulate the glucose levels in the body, degradation of toxins, synthesis of bile, and production of albumin, and all the other major hepatic functions while it is regenerating. The second approach is from the transdifferentiation of facultative stem cells or the liver progenitor cells, as they are called. These liver progenitor cells normally remain quiescent in the liver tissue. They get activated only under severe hepatic damage, as in the partial hepatectomy model, which damages almost two-thirds of the liver. Now, when regeneration cannot compensate for the lost part of liver as senescence, alcohol abuse, or disease, then these liver progenitor cells come into play, and they are capable of converting into different cell lines normally found in the liver. That are the hepatocytes or the oval cells as found in the human um, liver and stellate cells. The third approach is from the extrahepatic cells, uh, which are the hematopoietic stem cells or the HSCs and the mesenchymal stem cells or the MSCs. Now, these uh, stem cells are the ones which are derived from bone marrow. They reach the liver via blood circulation and where they undergo hepatogenic differentiation. This differentiation is not directly, uh, that they are not directly converted into hepatocytes. Rather, they first mix with the resident liver cells and then they participate in repopulating the liver cells. During the process of regeneration of the liver, there is activation of certain transcription factors like NOT and beta catenin. These transcription factors are able to downregulate the genes which are involved in differentiating functions of the liver cells. 
while the genes which are committing the cell to mitosis are upregulated. It has also been seen that there is increased blood supply and availability of circulating growth factors like the epidermal growth factor that promote mitosis and also certain hormones. The specialized blood vessels that are being formed now produce hepatocyte growth factor and also WNP2. Some non-hepatocytes are also activated to secrete mitogenic factors which are paracrine in nature. These factors allow the remaining hepatocytes to re-enter the cell cycle. For example, the Kupfer cells secrete interleukin-6 and the tumor necrosis factor alpha, which activates the adult immune system, while the stellate cells become activated and start secreting the hepatocyte growth factor or the scatter factor, as well as the transforming growth factor beta. The extracellular matrix begins to be digested. That is because the hepatocytes which are still connected to each other in epithelium cannot respond well to the hepatocyte growth factors which are being secreted. So certain metalloproteinase enzymes begin to be secreted which digest the extracellular matrix thereby allowing the hepatocytes to separate from one another which allows them to proliferate. The metalloproteinase also cleave the hepatocyte growth factor to activate it. Now the hepatocytes divide by preventing apoptosis, activating cyclins D and E and also by repressing the cyclin inhibitors such as P27 and secreting a highly potent hepatocyte mitogenic factor that is DGF alpha. After the liver has reached its appropriate size, it stops regrowing. And this regeneration of liver by compensatory regeneration mechanism is completed in 3 to 10 days, even when two-third mass of it is surgically removed. This uh, graph uh, shows the correlation of changes in gene expression with increase in liver mass, which follows the partial hepatectomy in mammals. Here you see that after partial hepatectomy, a well-coordinated set of all replications uh, of the cells occur among the resident cells of the liver in order to replace the lost liver mass and function. First and foremost, the parenchymal cell population of the liver, the hepatocytes, undergo cell proliferation. And here you see that the uh, DNA of the hepatocyte population of the liver is showing its peak around 24 hours as seen in rat. While the non-parenchymal cells also initiate their DNA synthesis at a much slower pace, among which the Kupfer cells and stellate cells peak at around 48 to 72 hours. Now, during the regenerative process, hepatocytes secrete many growth factors, as we just discussed, to which these non-parenchymal cells are responsive. These include the TGF, FGF, HGF, EGF, and in turn, these non-parenchymal cells also provide to the hepatocytes many growth factors, which help in their proliferation. So increase in DNA synthesis of both uh, this parenchymal and non-parenchymal cell population coincides with the growth in the liver mass as seen in the brown portion here. Also, uh, this coincides with the upregulation of growth-regulated genes, the cell cycle-regulated genes and uh, the overall gene expression after the growth phase, which reflects a functionality of the regenerated liver tissue. Now, what are the factors which affect regeneration in general? These are the factors, uh, predominantly the temperature. It is generally observed that temperature increases the regenerative ability of an organism, however, to a certain extent only. In plain area, it is seen that low temperatures might prevent regeneration while the higher temperatures promote it. Uh, in fact, very low temperatures or very high temperatures may prove lethal to the organism during amputation processes or the cutting processes rather than helping them regener regenerate. Now, food uh, generally does not affect regeneration to much extent. Even the animals which are starving or which are not getting adequate food supply are seen to degenerate in certain experiments. 
However, the supply of food may enhance the process of regeneration and the deficiency of food may decrease the size of regenerated tissue in certain animals. Nerve supply is an important factor affecting regeneration. Uh, innervation uh, or the nerves or the building up of the neurons begins to secrete certain neurotrophic factors which initiate and stimulate regeneration as we just saw during the regeneration of limb in salamanders. Another important factor is oxygen. Oxygen supply is essential for uh, building up of the cells and keeping them active during regeneration. Hormones, uh, predominantly the anterior pituitary hormones have seen, uh, have found to be essential during limb regeneration in amphibians. X-ray irradiation blocks mitosis, thereby uh, preventing regeneration from occurring as done experimentally. Well, the electrical field is shown to stimulate tissue regeneration and healing of fractures again has been demonstrated in certain experiments done in the laboratories. So this is all about the lecture regeneration. Let us summarize what we have studied today. Regeneration is a post embryonic morphogenetic phenomenon which when temporarily stimulated brings about repair of the damaged cells or tissues or replacement or redevelopment of sphered body parts or reconstruction of whole body from a small body fragment. The capacity to regenerate varies across species. In stem cell mediated regeneration such as in planarian regeneration, new cells are routinely produced to replace the ones that undergo regeneration. In epimorphosis that happens in the regenerating salamander limbs and fish fins, tissues form a regeneration blastema which divide and redifferentiate into a new structure. In morpholexis, which is characteristic of hydra, there is a repatterning of existing tissue with little or almost no growth. In compensatory regeneration, as seen in the mammalian liver, Cells divide, but at the same time, they retain their differentiated state. Regeneration can also be heteromorphic, supernumerary, or Wolfian in nature. Hydra produces head activation gradients, head inhibition gradients, and foot activation gradients, and budding occurs where these three gradients are minimal. Hydra can propagate by stem cell mediated regeneration, morpholexis, and epimorphosis. The hypostome in the head region acts as the organizer, while WNT3 acts as the inducer in hydra's body during regeneration. Limb regeneration in salamanders occurs by epimorphosis. At the point of amputation, the epidermis forms an apical ectodermal cap or the AEC, while the cells beneath this AEC dedifferentiate to form a blastema. Now, the dedifferentiated cells lose their adhesions and re enter the cell cycle thereby undergoing redifferentiation and regrowth to form lost part of the limb. During mammalian liver regeneration, no blastema is formed and the liver regenerates the same volume as it lost. Each cell appears to generate its own cell type. A reserve population of multipotent progenitor cell divides while these tissues cannot regenerate the missing portions. Now there are certain questions you can think about. First of all, comment on the statement. The stem cellness of the tissue in the hydra allows it to form its unique life cycle. So you have to find out what are the stem cells present in hydra and how do they help in, in uh, regeneration in hydra. Plastima is not a collection of unspecified multipotent progenitor cells but is a heterogeneous assortment of restricted progenitor cells. We have to justify this statement with respect to blastema, which occurs during regeneration of limb in case of salamon. Next, give an account of the control of regeneration by various extrinsic and extrinsic factors. So you have to club all the extrinsic and intrinsic factors to answer this question. Give an account of the catabolic and anabolic processes which are involved in regeneration. So we have to put up all the catabolic processes which are the degradation processes and the building up processes or the anabolic things which happen during regeneration. 
compare and contrast the process of regeneration with embryogenesis so you have to point out the points of similarities as well as the differences between the two what are the essential points of difference between morpholexis and epimorphosis how can the regeneration studies in hydra or salamander be useful in understanding the mechanism of regeneration in man so is this a point where the scientists are focusing on you have to find out the uh, mechanisms when where these regeneration studies can be useful why is regeneration considered an uh, usual form of asexual reproduction in several lower groups of animals these are the references books which have been consulted for the preparation of this lecture hope you had a good time learning with me thank you